Good morning and a very warm welcome to all of those of you in the room today and also to those who will be joining us um, remotely. Today we will explore how punitive drug policies have accelerated environmental degradation and pose a serious threat to climate mitigation, adaptation and justice. This is a timely meeting of aligning drug policy with environmental protection. We will be proposing recommendations to ensure that the UN and national drug policies support, instead of undermining the collective efforts made by international community and millions of activists risking their lives to protect nature. My name is Clemmy James. I am a climate activist and I am the Senior Policy and Campaigns Officer at Health Poverty Action. I'm also the coordinator of the Drug Policy, um, Drug Policy Reform and Environmental Justice Coalition, of which members of this panel sit with me. We are delighted today to be joined by the Colombian and the Brazilian delegation, two countries who are guardians to our planet's, one of our planet's largest carbon sinks and most precious rainforests, the Amazon. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you John Alexander Rojas Cabrera, the governor of Nareno from Colombia. Cordial saludo a todas y todos. Soy John Rojas, Hello del departamento de to all, Una I am the governor of Nareño another victim Colombia, of the conflict in Colombia. De las FARC a mi padre hace 27 the FARC embargo, killed my father 25 years ago. Reconciliation and pardon changed my life and the life of my family. And since then, I have dedicated myself to being a defender of peace, for greater well-being for my daughters, for our sons, and for Llego the Nariñenses and all Colombians. Mexico, I'm arriving here Marquez, to accompany the Vice President of Colombia, who was in Mexico, with the negotiations of the ELN. We continue to support the process, including the total peace that Petro, our President, Gustavo Petro, the change government, has proposed. I thank the United Nations and the UNODC, the Foreign Ministry, Vice Minister Laura Hill, the Ambassador, and all the team of the Embassy to permit my participation. And thank you to all the institutions and activists that defend the environment. Nariño is a department in the southwest of Colombia, 1,600,000 people, 33,000, 33% is part of an ethnic population, indigenous and Afro. We have a geostrategic place because the Pacific and the Andes and the Amazon are part of our state. We have um, UNESCO um, heritage, including the carnival, and we have this understanding around um, grass and mopa mopa. We have this richness, this biodiverse richness. Unfortunately, there are 56 thousand hectares of coca that are cultivated in Colombia. This is 28% of the total coca cultivation in Colombia. This, this represents 174 million dollars, 271 million in the pasta base, and 386 million uh, in hydrochloride coca. Drug 
control policies based in glyphosate and aerial uh, spraying and forced eradication have failed in Nariño after a week of aspersions, particularly in our, in our zone. This has contributed to an increase in cultivation. We have demonstrated that it is not a solution. It is a po policy that has failed and that before everything has had negative consequences in the security of people. In Nariño, in 2022, there have been 67 homicides, 46% of them. There have been 167. 46% have died in the municipal municipality of Tumaco. They have assassinated 34 leaders, three community leaders, 32 social leaders, 19 of them indigenous, four Afro, three community leaders, and one peasant leader. There are 13 structures that are at the margin of the law and that dispute territory. This conflict has brought us to this issue where the conclusion I can make is that there is a global market that is growing, demanding um, the consumption of drugs. Nariño with, its, with our social conditions and our geographic conditions and we understand that, that we have a business and a commercialization that comes from the coca and the presence of non-state um, actors and that the state presence has been weak. Therefore, we propose that we need to do a transformation of this illegal economy towards a legal, gradual, we are proposing a de development plan, an integrated development plan along in our zone where Tumaco can be a strategic port for Colombia and the world and to connect us with Brazil. The defense of the environment and the search for total peace is what we are looking for in this, so that our Afro-Indigenous and Campesino brothers and sisters can live in peace. We want to um, reduce the illegal logging and illegal cultivation because that's putting at risk our environment. For that reason, our petition, our, our request is that these territories, these diverse territories, will be given um, this support from all nations. Thanks, Kendra. Thank you, Clemmy. Thank you uh, to the organizers, to CND, to all of you uh, for being here. Uh, Gobernador, it is uh, an honor for me to uh, be with you all today. Two weeks ago, I was visiting this mangrove wetland on Costa Rica's Pacific coast. It's a small but vital part of the estimated 147 million hectares of mangroves that encircle the globe, providing key ecosystem services like carbon capture and storage, coastal protection, and fisheries management. This is why the IPCC urges mangrove protection worldwide, and it's why these Costa Rican wetlands are recognized under the Ramsar Convention uh, for their biological and ecological economic importance to coastal people's livelihoods, including the eco-tour that I was part of. But as I learned on that trip, the future of these mangroves hinges as much on biodiversity conventions as, as it does on the drug policies uh, that are being brokered here in Vienna uh, this week. Our superb guide, uh, Carlos, made the connections clear. He told us that over the, could you go back to the, yeah, no, the other, perfect, yeah. He, yeah, I'll, I'll, thank you. He told us that over the past six years, ever since the U.S. Coast Guard had increased patrol pressures on the high seas, trafficking, smugglers running cocaine and marijuana by boat 
from Colombia to northern Central America have been using the wetlands for drug storage and fuel provisioning. And they're paying uh, local people's unheard of sums to ferry gasoline to them. The effects of their activities are inescapable. Uh, channels are being cut through the mangroves. Young men are leaving fishing and ecotourism for easy money facilitating trafficking. Some have gone to jail. Some have been killed. Others are laundering illicit earnings in the fishing and ecotourism businesses in ways that make it much harder for legitimate businesses like Carlos to compete and which put further pressure on an already uh, diminished fish stock. Others are using drug dollars to expand oil palm plantations and cattle pasture into the wetlands. It's illegal, but no one speaks about these environmentally destructive dynamics because no one trusts anyone anymore. Not members of fishing cooperatives, not neighbors, not the police. In effect, Carlos summarized in this small but vital site what I and my collaborators have spent the past 10 years documenting at larger scales across uh, Central uh, America, what others have documented in South America, and what others have documented around the world. And that is that the global drug regime is orthogonal to building the sorts of environmental and climate resilience that the planet urgently needs. Let me scale out from Carlos's insights to highlight three mechanisms by which this happens. First, uh, and I, I want to say I base my comments on a pretty, I would argue, a compelling body of evidence, a small part of which is presented uh, here if you'd like to learn more details. But first, I want to be very clear that I'm not talking about the impact of drug crop production on the environment. That is for other speakers to discuss. What I'm talking about is how dramatic environmental harms concentrate in spaces of drug transit and are associated with the investment of drug profits in those spaces. And that originates in the fact that counter-narcotic police and military actions relentlessly push traffickers into remote frontier areas, uh, often indigenous lands and protected areas. But these remote biodiverse areas are not just logistically convenient, they are also frontiers. So from a business perspective, they represent ideally undercapitalized spaces that are superb for absorbing surplus capital from the drug trade. In, through the transformation of forests uh, into oil palm plantations, cattle pastures, uh, aguacate plantations, lo que sea. These are great ways to launder dollars di and diversify income and asset portfolios for traffickers. So to be clear, drug traffickers, for drug traffickers destroying forests and land grabbing is logistically and financially best practice. Second, uh, just as Carlos made clear in Costa Rica as elsewhere, the profitability of drug trafficking means that the trade can seriously distort rural economies. No legitimate activity can compete with a trade that generates billions of dollars annually. In some Central American countries, profits from cocaine transshipment in some years have exceeded direct foreign investment and the value of agricultural exports. The tsunami of drug dollars pulls rural land and labor out of food production, increases the price of staple goods, and further subsidizes extractive activities like gold mining, wildlife trafficking, and illegal, illegal timber harvests. These environmental crimes are more often than not made possible by capital from the drug trade. Third, the IPCC's recent climate change and land uh, report identifies several policy levers that can protect existing forests and restore degraded forest lands, such as capacity building to support resilient biodiverse uh, food production systems and democratic responsive governance systems to manage land at multiple scales. But what happens when existing forests and lands ripe for restoration are coveted or controlled by organized criminals enriched by the drug trade? There is much evidence to show us that effective man the effective management required for their protection is fundamentally undercut by the violent power of organized crime, who will always prioritize their business interests uh, over environmental protection. And as we know too well, and as uh, the governor has just told us, uh, traffickers will kill or compromise anyone who might stand in their way. There is just too much money in the drug trade too much power to control the fate of too much of the world's lands and forests. We have learned from 50 years of counter-narcotic policy 
that there is virtually no amount of military aid, development aid, or anti-corruption initiatives or governance capacity building that can compete. Anyone on the ground in the world's tropical frontiers knows this, and they know why. Because they understand what makes Narcos so rich and powerful in the first place. People like Carlos know. He had an enviably straightforward analysis for the social and environmental problems he was witnessing in his community. Next slide. The real problem, he said, was that drugs were illegal. Being illegal made their trade risky, which made them expensive, which meant lots of money. He was emphatic that there will always be demand for drugs. He said controlling drugs in the way that alcohol is controlled was a possible path forward. But not just in one place, he cautioned. As you can read here, he made a good case for global legal regulation. So to align drug policy with environmental protection, I think we should listen. Thank you. Thank you, Kendra. And, and now I'd like to introduce Dave Brudy Taylor from the Global Drug Policy Observatory. Okay, so I'd like to begin, I promise, a very short presentation um, with a quote from the year 2000 by the Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Programme. I'm not going to read the whole quote there, you can do that, but what I'd like to just highlight is the final sentence, which I will read. Although scientists are now able to appreciate the complexity of this web of interacting natural processes, we're still a very long way from understanding how they all fit together. And I think we can argue that this idea of complexity and the processes to improve understanding of how things fit together can be applied not only to our growing understanding of interconnected environmental processes, but also intersecting international issue area regimes and the notion of global governance more generally, including in relation to protection of the environment. And indeed, only a few years after this quote, the International Law Commission established a study group to look at the topic of the fragmentation of international law. And within academia, and particularly within the discipline of international relations, we see around the same time the emergence in the literature of the concept of regime complexes. Now, while typically in academia, I guess there's no agreed definition, what we're really talking about here is an array of partially overlapping and non-hierarchical institutions governing a particular issue area. There's general agreement that such a situation generates um, what we can call rule complexity, and that regime intersection is characterised by complementarity as well as oftentimes, and I would argue more frequently, by tension and conflict. So in terms of international drug policy then, this is in many ways, I think, another dimension of the age-old problem of system-wide coherence, and this is something that Kendra alluded to. And arguably, however, when we're working towards coherence, it's getting more, more pressing as there's a growing understanding of how what's often referred to as the global drug control regime or various variations of that, and then a range of related policy interven interventions uh, beneath that intersect with an array of interconnected elemental regimes or regime complexes, including those relating to two associated areas, human rights, and then within that, indigenous rights, and the environment. Um, after all, drug policy at all levels of governance is a classic example of a cross-cutting issue. And these are issues that were flagged up by the CND chair in his opening remarks. Now, I think it's fair to say, it, I think it wouldn't be unfair to say, that what goes on here in Vienna, it's been quite slow to appreciate these interconnections. And furthermore, where the connection is made, some actors inevitably remain resistant, and while progress has certainly been achieved in some areas, there often remain significant tensions. And of course, the example for this is between drug policy and human rights, and we've seen it in many parts of the Commission over the week. Now, clearly there has been progress, but more work certainly needs to be done. And closely related to Indigenous rights in particular is a currently far less visible regime intersection where more work definitely needs to be done. And this relates to global drug control and what we can define as the global environmental regime or regime complex, including within that 
what we might want to define as the biodiversity regime complex. And I think biodiversity is an issue that often gets overlooked in the very welcome debate about drugs policy and climate change. And of course, it's very important with, in, in relation to a range of policies targeting crops deemed to be illicit, but also, again, as, as Kendra alluded to, also in relation to what happens around transit hubs. So this slide, apologies it's so uh, dense, is really an early attempt just to map drug policy on top of existing intersections within the, the biodiversity complex and identify points of tension. Now, I think of particular relevance here, and this is just what I want to highlight, is um, the 1992 Convention on Biological Diversity. And this is particularly relevant to our discussions in light of the recent COP15 meeting and the 30 by 30 target. Now, within the CBD, um, there's recognition, explicit recognition for the first time that conservation of biological diversity is a common concern for humankind and an integral part of the development process. And within this context, um, I think it is in many ways positive to see last year the passage of the, the annual AD, Alternative Development Resolution uh, 65.1, which within the title as well as the content spoke about measures to protect the environment. And among other things, the resolution flagged up the work of the CBD and crucially encouraged member states to deploy relevant human development indicators. And as many of you probably know, within the cow at the moment, there's discussions about L3. There's lots of good things in L3, uh, particularly, I think, the explicit mention of indigenous peoples. That would be capital I, capital P. But we'll have to see what, <coughs> excuse me, survives negotiations as the week moves on. Now, this point about indicators and metrics, I think, is crucial in moving away from generalised and abstract discussions and to highlight the need to start thinking in a very practical terms about how to facilitate and where necessary soften the, these regime interfaces. And in fact, the CBD sets up a framework for impact assessment and minimizing adverse impacts. That's under Article 14. But I think we can and should go further on this. For example, along similar lines to the idea of introducing human rights, risk, and impact assessments for new laws and drug policies, why not work on developing a specific biodiversity risk assessment framework to model environmental impacts? So to conclude then, I think as it's been argued elsewhere, as complexity and regime intersections increase, I think we're likely to see the emergence of a new architecture within which international drug policy operates. And where the environment is concerned, to borrow the earlier terminology, there now exists a web of interactions involving system-wide initiatives like the SDGs, um, crucial documents like the UN System Common Position on Drugs, uh, a range of actors beyond member states, so UN agencies, NGOs, and then above this, an array of regimes and associated state obligations. I think that's the key, the key point here, state obligations. So, you know, perhaps we, we might want to call this the global governance complex for drug control. I don't know. But whichever way it's framed, the often conflictual relationship between drug policy and the protection of biological diversity and how that relates to indigenous rights is an issue that's too important to ignore and deserves increased attention at all levels of governance, including here in Vienna, and particularly as we prepare for the midterm review next year. Thank you. Thank you very much for your words at this side event. I come from San Jose, San Jose Guavare. De manera continua, y contamos con grandes ríos tributarios del Orinoco y el Amazonas. Nuestros ecosistemas son la transición entre los Andes y el gran bioma de la Amazonía, clave para el equilibrio del planeta. Colombia es el segundo país con mayor biodiversidad del mundo. En los últimos 20 años, en Colombia se han deforestado más de 3 millones 100 mil hectáreas, según el Ministerio de Ambiente. De ellas, 1.800.000 hectáreas de bosques estaban en la Amazonia, unas 90.000 hectáreas por año deforestadas solo en esta región. Como se puede ver en, en una de las diapositivas anteriores, hay una transición entre el, la selva pura 
El momento de la deforestación y las tierras que antes eran selva convertidas ahora en potreros, donde incluso de manera paradójica los ganaderos hacen una serie de estanques para acumular agua para animales, especialmente para sus vacas. Una de las causas asociadas a la deforestación son los cultivos de coca. El 52% de los cultivos están en áreas de manejo ambiental, 21% en tierras de comunidades negras, 17% en reservas forestales, 4% en parques naturales y 10% en tierras indígenas. Pero a nivel nacional, en 2021, la coca aportó el 8% del total deforestado, según el Informe Global de Drogas para según el Instituto de Estudios Ambientales de mi país, durante 2021 en Guaviare, en mi región, se deforestaron en total 25.000 hectáreas de bosques. Aunque en COCA solo había un poco, una cifra cercana a las 7.000 hectáreas, por lo tanto, algo debe explicarse pues fue más la tala que la coca sembrada. En ese mapa se muestran las zonas con mayor concentración de la deforestación actualmente en nuestro país. A esa zona se le ha llamado el arco de deforestación del norte de la Amazonia. Si uno pudiera poner también el mapa de la deforestación por el lado del Brasil, se vería una mancha similar, pero en un arco en sentido contrario que va hacia el norte. El cultivo de coca fue el sustento de un proceso de colonización interna en el cual las familias campesinas buscaron tierras en zonas donde no habían instituciones del Estado ante la falta de una reforma agraria. A comienzos de los años 80, la coca se cultivaba cerca de centros poblados, pero desde que se adoptó la primera ley contra estupefacientes, los cultivos se instalaron cada vez más lejos, en lo profundo de la selva, lo cual conllevó una primera gran ola de deforestación. Los cultivos de coca causan riesgos y daños ambientales, como lo saben los amigos de Nariño. Es cierto, los cultivadores usan herbicidas y productos elaborados por grandes compañías químicas para que sus plantas crezcan más rápido y usan grandes cantidades de gasolina, cemento, permanganato de potasio, amoníaco, sulfúrico y otros agentes químicos en el procesamiento de pasta a base de coca. También es cierto que los desechos de la hoja de coca procesada con tales químicos se arrojan sin ningún tratamiento al suelo y a fuentes de agua en muchas ocasiones. Las afectaciones ambientales por el cultivo de coca incluyen deforestación, la que destruye corredores biológicos clave para fauna y flora, afecta insectos y abejas en particular y ocasiona contaminación de suelos y agua también. Pero para eliminar los cultivos y reducir la oferta de cocaína, el Estado arribó hace unos 40 años a estos territorios, primero que todo con bases militares y puestos de policía. Una débil institucionalidad se dio espacio a las agendas de seguridad. Así surgieron y se aplicaron programas antidrogas. El herbicida glifosato, por ejemplo, se había usado desde finales de los años 70 contra el cultivo de marihuana en la región de Santa Marta, al norte del país. Y a partir de 1994, el gobierno ordenó campañas de expresión aérea contra los cultivos de coca. Durante 21 años seguidos, nuestros territorios fueron fumigados con agroquímicos desde el aire y con aviones de combate en medio de una fuerte militarización terrestre, aspecto que aumentó durante la época del Plan Colombia. Los cultivos de coca se trasladaron de un lugar a otro cada vez más llegando hasta resguardos indígenas, parques naturales y territorios colectivos de comunidades negras, a pesar de aquellos programas todavía hoy existen más cultivos de coca que hace 20 años. Las cifras ya se han contado aquí. Cerca de 5 millones de acres fueron fumigados por vía aérea y más de 2 millones de acres por vía terrestre. Decenas de miles de infraestructuras de procesamiento de pasta base han sido destruidas por las autoridades sin ningún protocolo ambiental. Toneladas de desechos químicos han sido incineradas en medio de los bosques derivando a fuentes de agua y a los suelos también. Entonces, las acciones de reducción de la oferta causaron un una duplicación de la deforestación, dispersaron los cultivos a zonas con mayor importancia ambiental, afectaron cultivos de alimentos, impactaron el ciclo biológico de fauna y flora en particular, insectos como las abejas y contaminaron fuentes de agua. En adición a estas aspersiones se aplicaron también sin protocolos de protección a la salud humana, lo que significó una victimización de personas a las cuales el Estado aún no repara. Lo más preocupante es que encontramos un efecto perverso de estas políticas de drogas. Miles de familias, como se mostraba en un mapa anterior, fueron desplazadas de sus predios en, en mi región, por ejemplo, la mitad de la población 
es desplazada según cifras oficiales a causa de las aspersiones aéreas por la pérdida de su seguridad alimentaria, por la quiebra de su economía campesina y por el conflicto armado. El empobrecimiento del campesinado y la falta de oportunidades brindadas por el Estado facilitó en años recientes un modelo de acaparamiento de tierras en pocas manos, la praderización de la selva y la ganadería extensiva insostenible que deforesta más que los cultivos de coca para cocaína. Esto quiere decir que si bien los cultivos and, and, um, de coca no son actualmente la principal water, razón que explica uh, la deforestación, uh, sí son, uh, sí son uh, punta de lanza de la expansión de la frontera agrícola, del avance del latifundio, sort of incluso del lavado de dinero de mafias dedicadas al narcotráfico se, que se encuentran this, enquistadas most, en el propio poder uh, del Estado. Most, uh, Finalmente, una reflexión en voz alta. Perverse, uh, Para que la coca no se instale en donde causa enorme daño ambiental, como se ve en este mapa, en las puntas rojas, Tendríamos que pensar data. políticas de drogas que abran espacio a la regulación de la hoja y la cocaína. Pero como esto no es factible por ahora, debemos convivir con la coca reduciendo riesgos y daños del cultivo y su procesamiento. Y reducir los daños de las políticas de drogas que afectan aún más a los ecosistemas y a las comunidades. Como se ve acá, tendríamos que aceptar que es más fácil que una familia campesina obtenga ingresos básicos de dos hectáreas de coca y de economías verdes y aceptar que esto es más sostenible en términos ambientales que el modelo de ganadería extensiva que se come diariamente nuestros Muchas gracias. Thanks, Clemmy. Um, I think as all previous interventions have made plain, um, drugs are unequivocally an environmental issue. I think it's a, that's a very, very strong message that we want to send out with the organization um, of this side event. And in the brief presentation that I will make, um, I want to suggest a, a kind of three opportunities or, or a triad of recommendations, if you will, about how this debate around the impacts of environmental impacts of drugs and environmental impacts of drug policy uh, can be taken forward. So I will in go briefly through three recommendations um, I will make. The first recommendation is to integrate the environmental impacts of drug policy into the 2022 midterm review of international drug policy commitments as reflected in the 2019 CND ministerial declaration. Um, it was already mentioned briefly earlier, but there's also an already agreed upon modalities resolution at this uh, CND that sets out the process and format for such a review process, including the organization of two interactive multi-stakeholder roundtables in parallel with the plenary proceedings on the topics taking stock, work undertaken since 2019, and then looking forward, the way forward, um, the road to 2029 and beyond. I would argue that in light of government commitments, state obligations really, uh, coming out of both the climate and biodiversity COPs, it is crucial that the environmental concerns in relation to drugs and drug policy are integrated into this review process and in the plans for the coming five-year period. As the UN Secretary General has said, Making peace with nature is the defining task of the 21st century. It must be the top, top priority for everyone, everywhere. And it is notable in this respect that for the first time, uh, the 2022 UNODC's World Drug Report included a special booklet on drugs and the environment. This can be a useful platform to build on uh, for this review process. However, I would argue that in this review process, um, the international drug policy community must acknowledge the breadth and severity of the environmental impacts associ associated with drug control policies, particularly for countries in the global south. And member states should commit themselves to reforming policies to eliminate this damage. Some of our mo more detailed proposals for doing so are contained in a response that a number of organizations represented here today uh, issued uh, to respond to the World Drug Report and the special booklet, um, copies of which can also be found um, in the corner of the room. So I would encourage you to read it. So that's the first recommendation, is really about this midterm review process and yeah, the absolute critical importance of integrating environmental issues there. The second uh, recommendation um, can really be summed up um, in the phrase, uh, don't go it alone. 
the agreements of the UN Common Position on Drugs and linkages to the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda are all welcome developments that can help to foster UN system-wide coherence and overcome some of the regime contradictions and blind spots that David spoke about earlier. Um, there is certainly much scope, uh, I would submit, at both in-country programmatic level, but also at international regime level, for greater interagency collaboration between UNODC and agencies such as the United Nations Environmental Program, Environment Program, United Nations Development Program, the FAO, the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, uh, to mention but a few, to enhance understanding of the drugs, environment, development nexus. And such interagency collaboration could help in the formulation of what could be called an environmental harm reduction approach um, that can be used to submit drug, drug control policies to an, an environmental stress test or a risk assessment framework, um, as was also spoken about earlier. This would not only put an end, uh, if such a stress test or risk assessment framework were to be adopted, would not only put an end to harmful drug control strategies, such, such as forced eradication or badly designed crop substitution programs, but can also be used to predict and prevent future harm moving forward. So that's the second recommendation about um, breaking silos, interagency collaboration, environmental harm reduction and risk assessment framework. Uh, the third and final recommendation is really about um, some international reform processes. And it's really looking at how best to integrate environmental standards within models of legal regulation. Taking the example of cannabis, for example, uh, the environmental record in jurisdictions where cannabis has been regulated is decidedly mixed. On the one hand, we see the emergence of a standards testing and trade regime that is driving a lot of cultivation indoors, where inter alia the use of high intensity grow lights contributes to high greenhouse gas emissions associated with indoor greenhouse production. This has come at the expense of legacy can cannabis growers, including in traditional producing countries in the global south, where sun-grown cannabis cultivation is the norm. On the other hand, uh, the design of environmental standards cannot become so onerous, so burdensome, so complex that it generates barriers to entry for those wishing, wishing to transition from the illicit to the illicit market. This cumbersome bureaucracy has, for example, been identified as one of the main reasons for the continuance of an extensive illicit cannabis market, even in jurisdictions where cannabis has been regulated, allowing only bigger players or multi state operators to successfully navigate uh, the market. This not only facilitates corporate capture, but without proper safeguards in place, also opens up the door to industry greenwashing. A number of organizations represented here today have been engaging in, over the years in dialogues with governments, uh, operators, civil society groups, and growers about models of cannabis regulation that allow for social equity and environmental sustainability to go hand in hand. There are lessons to be learned, both positive and negative, from experiences with transitions from illicit to regulated markets. And it's important that the CND can provide a space where these lessons can be socialized and where an honest debate and frank exchange can take place. And this is salient not only uh, in terms of cannabis reform, but also in light of the call by the governments of Bolivia and Colombia for an independent review process of the scheduling of the coca leaf. We have heard at this CND, both in plenary and in a number of side events uh, this week on this issue. Uh, these have included also lived testimony from cocalero, peasant and indigenous communities of the human rights and environmental harms that follow from the persecution of particular plants and the perverse and uninten unintended consequences of punitive drug control policies. Thank you, Sylvia. Final sentence, and I'm just perfect timing. I would, uh, I would just like to leave you with this thought that I think that repairing this rupture of humans from nature, um, that prohibition really has engendered, must be a central priority uh, and direction of travel for all concerned in aligning drug policy with environmental protection. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, and Finally, I'm pleased to say we have closing remarks um, from um, Marta Macado, the National Security Secretary for Drug Policy Brazil. Thank you.
Thank you. I, I thank the Transnational Institute for organizing this, uh, this session. I think it's extremely urgent that we connect drug policies with environmental protection. And uh, when we talk about environment, uh, the kind of urgency we have is exceptional. I thank my colleagues. That was uh, I was really impressed with, with their presentations. I just want to give a, a final comment on the situation on the Brazilian Amazon. I think you all know that the last government uh, interrupted the surveillance uh, on the Amazon. Uh, in fact, it, uh, they, the government exonerated officials who have acted against the organized crime, defended the invasion of indigenous land and supported illegal mining. So. Uh, during the last government, Brazil reached the highest deforestation rates in 15 years. The destruction uh, of the Amazon was raised to historic levels. Illegal mining also has raised um, and expanded, especially inside indigenous territory, territories as never before, uh, with dramatic consequences, as you all saw the, the recent images of the Yanomani uh, people uh, uh, with, uh, dying uh, of many diseases that came with the illegal mining outside. The rivers were all contaminated with mercurio and they had no, no food. So in the, the fact that uh, the government created this free zone without surveillance, uh, it uh, created this coalition or, uh, or created or... Uh, incentivize this coalition between networks of uh, drug trafficking and environmental organized crime. So they are now sharing the infrastructure and logistic. Uh, so they are using the same routes for transportation and illegal mining has been, has been uh, a source of money laundering. So the most impor important drug cartel in Brazil is now uh, deeply involved with the organized crime in Amazonia. And I would make a bracket and say that uh, this uh, big uh, drug cartel in Brazil was also strengthened after decades of politics of mass incarceration. And the, the previous drug policy has a lot to do uh, with that result. Uh, I wanted to mention that there is the situation uh, in this within the situation there is a constant violence against indigenous population they are expelled from their territories the rivers have been poisoned uh, and uh, there is a progressive involvement also with the local populations in different chains of this uh, of this uh, network uh, I, would, I must say that our main problem is not uh, crops, but uh, the transit and other uh, chains of the, of the uh, organized crime. And finally, indigenous women are constant victims of sexual violence. So this is just to make a, a brief description of what we're living and how urgent it is that we tackle this, the, the, the problem together. Uh, the, our Minister of Justice uh, just established a program that's called uh, Amazonia Mas Segura, uh, Safer Amazon, and there is uh, of course, a uh, big police, federal police operation to try to, uh, to expel illegal mining from the indigenous lands and to apprehend all their equipment and etc. But besides that, we are also sending healthcare, social assistance, and uh, territorial development. This is one of the discussions we are having here at CND. How can we adapt the idea of alternative development? to foster territorial development in the Amazonia and combining it, of course, with environmental protection. Uh, we are now also changing uh, the law on, on the gold chain. There was, in fact, uh, a problem in our legislation that made that uh, traceability uh, very weak. But I also would like to call the responsibility of the global financial market that are receiving gold from uh, illegal mining in Brazil and that comes from deforestation and, and uh, violation of indigenous rights. So 
that that was really just to call attention to the situation and to reinforce my colleague's speech on the importance of this uh, panel. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, Marta. Um, so we will conclude. Thank you to all of our speakers this morning and to all of our co-sponsors. Um, and we will now have a little video. En la esquina estratégica de Sudamérica, bañado por el Mar Pacífico, como puerta de entrada a la Amazonía, está el departamento de Nariño, frontera de Colombia con Ecuador. Nariño es un territorio colmado de oportunidades para conectar a Colombia y a Sudamérica con el mundo. Nariño es un destino turístico por excelencia, una tierra biodiversa, hogar de especies únicas y humedales de importancia mundial. Cuenta con ríos y lagunas, reservas ecológicas, volcanes y nevados, playas, ballenas y aves de majestuoso colorido. Nariño es la tierra donde se produce hoy por hoy el mejor café especial del mundo. Nariño es manos laboriosas, personas talentosas, deporte y aventura. Nariño es carnaval, donde se mezclan culturas, tradiciones, mitos y leyendas. Nariño es fe, es esperanza, es trabajo, es gente buena. Nariño es territorio de paz. Recorre Nariño, descubre su magia. Wow, okay. Yeah. And this is, this is how you live. Wow, I mean, great. That was, a, that was an amazing video. Brings a bit of color to this building. Um, so I feel we, we actually have room for a, a few questions. So um, we've got five minutes. Maria Alejandra, please direct your question to whoever you'd like to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much for oh, sorry. Thank you very much for this amazing panel. I I, I do believe the need that. Uh, well, thank you for your work as well. Thanks. <laughs> the environmental policy needs to talk with the with the drug policy agenda. Uh, maybe this is a question for Silvia, but for the rest of you as well. And it's the what do you think about the need of uh, directing, for example, instruments such as the payment for ecosystem services to coca crop farmers uh, or. Um, yeah, anyone who is cultivating uh, crops for illegal trade, because I, I do think that that's a, an instrument to help with this uh, transition to legal economies, but also to stop the, the frontier moving uh, to the forest. I can certainly make a start, but if others also want to, to add, um, certainly. Um, I think it's an interesting um, proposal, um, and I know there have been very, very initial ex some experiments also in Colombia with with payments for ecosystem services in the context of potentially also um, some coca uh, transitions. The only um, ca note of caution I would perhaps introduce here is that, of course, payments for ecosystem services um, benefit those that already are owners of, of environmental assets, so to speak. So, um, because the payments have to be directed to um, certain beneficiaries, and often those, the beneficiaries that are, that are recognized are those with already with land titles or who already have some kind of um, ownership or management of um, particular environmental goods and services. And so for, for populations that have been displaced, for example, or, or otherwise landless uh, populations, how to how the payments for ecosystem services can be structured to benefit those kind of groups is just is just one concern I have with with that um, mechanism. But I think it's certainly an interesting incentive and, and reward scheme, and, and to support you know um, communities that are, are really guardians of uh, of the environment. So certainly holds promise, but there are also some notes of caution. Um, Does anyone else want to say anything on that particular question? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Miri. Are there any other questions? Yo puedo decir algo para útil de... ¿Sí? ¿Quizá? ¿Sí? Ese también es propaganda de nuestro, de, de nuestro país. El, el presidente Gustavo Petro ha propuesto para un plan para salvar a la Amazonia. Ese plan, según sus palabras, eh, en Leticia, frontera con Brasil, 
incluye hacer unos pactos con 100 mil familias Brazil, campesinas e indígenas que están en la frontera norte de nuestra Amazonía y pagarles a ellos un valor económico cada mes durante los próximos 20 años. Ese valor sería algo así como unos 600 dólares mensuales eh, a precio de hoy. That would be the price Pero of el, el presidente y And nuestro gobierno necesitan fondos para hacer un plan como este. Like Prácticamente es, es una uh, propuesta it, que no tiene precisamente la figura de pago por servicios ambientales. Si no es, es un pacto en el cual dejan atrás estas so familias, really los cultivos de coca, dejan atrás uh, la ganadería y se uh, dedican a coca, restaurar coca, los bosques que han sido talados. Really Respecto de los pagos por servicios ambientales, hay algunas preocupaciones en algunas comunidades. En, se ha ensayado la figura de los contratos de uso. Es decir, el Estado no titula la tierra directamente a la familia, pero hace una especie de concesión para que las familias puedan utilizar el predio durante un tiempo. En el gobierno anterior se proponían 10 años. A las familias campesinas esto no les da seguridad jurídica y quieren que sea más años. El presidente está proponiendo en el Plan Nacional de Desarrollo que estos contratos o concesiones forestales con familias campesinas sean de largo plazo, por lo menos a 30 años, para tener un poco más de seguridad en, en esos pactos. Y último, tenemos una gran preocupación con el mercado de bonos de carbono, porque hay unas firmas inescrupulosas que se han dedicado a comercializar los servicios que ofrece nuestra selva amazónica de captura de CO2, y algunas incluso hacen estas transacciones económicas en las bolsas de valores más importantes del mundo, pero sobre la base de arrasar con los derechos de las familias indígenas o campesinas que habitan en estas zonas del país. Seguramente esta es una preocupación también en el hermano país de Brasil, pero este es un buen, una buena tribuna para decirles que estamos muy preocupados por eso. Gracias. Tenemos una pregunta más. ¿Quieres levantar? Sí. Hola. Buenas. Buenos días a todos y todas. To Solamente para reafirmar lo que dice Pedro, un Pedro país sin propietarios no puede tener políticas a largo plazo. Really Necesitamos que los campesinos cocaleros sean propietarios de sus tierras, no que les presten la tierra, porque la tierra prestada nadie la cuida. La tierra propia se cuida, la tierra propia se, se quiere y la, la tierra propia es la que podemos administrar eh, con amor y pensando en nuestros hijos y en nuestros nietos. La tierra prestada la usamos, la arrasamos, la acabamos y terminamos sirviéndole a las mafias. And ya sea de la minería, ya sea de la ganadería, mining, o ya sea del narcotráfico, pero necesitamos un país de propietarios. En la Amazonía hay serios problemas con la tenencia de la tierra, hay serios problemas con la inestabilidad de los pueblos, porque hay pueblos nómadas que no han sido legalmente constituidos como propietarios de las áreas protegidas, y tenemos unos serios problemas donde la gente no se ha visto se ha visto el verde de los bosques pero no se ha visto la gente que habita ese bosque y necesitamos urgente que se pongan de acuerdo el gobierno con los agentes administradores de estos territorios para eh, que haya una, una política real de tenencia de tierra legal y poder establecer políticas públicas a largo plazo Pedro, do you want to respond or no? No, no, no. no. Great, great. Okay, um, I think that brings us to the end. And um, I just want to encourage you all to be curious, be bold. For many people, the environment is a new thing. It's the defining issue of our time. It can feel really overwhelming, but we have to include it in all of our work. Um, and hopefully in years to come, we will see the change that we're all part of. 
So thank you so much for attending and thank you to our co-sponsors and our panel. Um, and, our and our interpreter, yeah, Zara, Zara. Zara Snap. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day.